Sorry to, I think I'm right on time. Sorry, you know, I thought I was a little bit late. Was filming a commercial with uh, Heisman Trophy winner George Rogers in my office. Always great to see George back on campus and enjoyed uh, visiting with him as well. And he's doing awesome. So just finished that up and, and came right in here. Appreciate everybody coming out today. Uh, kind of kicking off uh, spring practice here in a week or so, but wanted to get in here and have a chance to visit with you before we have practice one as well. Uh, before we get going on that, certainly want to congratulate Matilde Kless for winning the Darius Rucker Intercollegiate uh, Tournament down there yesterday on Hilton Head Island. Uh, I've been, I was at that tournament last year, didn't get a chance to go this year, but what a great field of uh, golfers that are in that tournament and pretty cool for a Gamecock to win a uh, tournament named after Darius uh, that Darius puts on. So congratulations to her and uh, best of luck to Kaylin and her team as they continue to uh, play this spring as well and continue to get better. I know it's a big weekend coming up for Gamecock Athletics and we've got equestrian, women's tennis, softball, beach volleyball, men's tennis all playing this weekend uh, in, in, on their, in their sports. And then obviously we've got a really big baseball series coming up. So I want to wish Coach Kingston and his team uh, best of luck this weekend as well as Coach Staley and her team as they head up to Greenville for the SEC tournament. So I'm looking forward to being in Greenville Saturday for baseball. And then you can't assume anything or look ahead, but anticipating they'll win Friday and have a chance to watch our women's basketball team play in the semifinals on Saturday afternoon. So it should be a fun day in, uh, in Greenville on Saturday. Best of luck to all of them competing. Hope you enjoyed getting to know all of our new uh, transfers that have come in here, uh, here this morning. It's a great group of young men. Wanted you to have the opportunity to visit with them and, and uh, they've really done a great job of adjusting and acclimating to what we're doing here at Carolina and couldn't be more excited about them being here. There's a lot of new faces obviously in our program right now with the incoming freshmen that are here, the new transfers that have come in as well, new coaches and staff members that have come in. So it's, uh, uh, I've said it before, we just can't assume that everything is going to go a certain way in 2023 because of what had happened in 2022. We've got a lot of new faces and it'll be key for us how quickly we can come together uh, as a team, as a coaching staff and how connected we can get here in a short period of time. And then add to that with the incoming guys that will be here in June after they graduate uh, high school as well. Excited about the coaching staff that we have intact, uh, the new guys that we've added, uh, the ones that have stayed. We've had coaches on this year's staff that have turned down opportunities in the NFL, turned down opportunities in the SEC, turned down opportunities in the ACC to go, to go places and coach. Just had one this week that turned down a fellow SEC East school. So it's great to know that there's a lot of people that are interested in our coaches. Uh, I've said it before, we've got a heck of a coaching staff here at Carolina. And when so many teams are trying to hire your coaches, uh, it's a great statement about what we have here at Carolina and where we're going as well. Challenge for us, and I've challenged everybody in our football program since we came back in January, is how can we con continue to get better, that we're not staying the same. Don't think that everything, just because something went well last year or worked well last year, that it's just status quo. How can we be better in everything that we're doing, the weight room, the training room, recruiting, coaching, nutrition, you name it, video, uh, on and on and on. So let's find ways to do things better than they've ever been done before. Really pleased with the way that our guys have worked. Here in the last uh, two months, it's a very workmanlike group. Uh, I know Coach Day is really excited about this group and the way they've been working in the weight room uh, and the leadership is coming together on this team right now. We've got uh, a final team workout, uh, or they lifted this morning, a final team workout tonight and then spring break next week. So it'll be good for our guys to get away for a little bit. And then we come back right after spring break and start practice on the Tuesday uh, that we get back from spring break. So excited to get back out on the field uh, without a doubt. Uh, it's exciting to be going into March from a recruiting standpoint to be able to get young men back on our campus this month. February is a dead period, so we haven't had any prospects on campus since January. Uh, so now that we're into March, hot, uh, recruits are able to visit. Got a great group of guys that are planning on coming throughout the month of March and April during spring practice. And, and anyone else that wants to come, come on. We got something special going on here at Carolina and excited to show uh, prospects and their families what we have. Uh, a couple just injury updates with our guys as we go into spring practice. Uh, don't anticipate 
uh, Tonka Hemingway or Case and Henry being able to do anything during spring practice. Uh, both of those guys uh, had a, a surgery, a surgical procedure within the last few weeks or last month or so, nothing major, uh, just to be able to go clean up some things from the end of last season so they can be at their best going in uh, to this season. So they won't participate in spring practice, but should will be good to go as we go into the summertime when they get back for summer workouts. Uh, Jordan Strawn and Mo Caba will certainly be limited as they recover from their injuries and surgeries from the 2022 season. Don't expect uh, Mo and Jordan to be able to, to do much during spring practice, if any, but they're trying to so we can hopefully get some stuff out of them uh, in practice. But their rehab is going great, and they look great out there. They're moving around well in the limited things that they were able to do. And then same thing with David Spalding. Probably more likely that David will be able to do something in spring practice uh, as, com as opposed or, or compared to Jordan and Mo uh, with David, potentially the last half of spring practice, we'll be able to get him out here and out on the field and get him going. But other than that, knock on wood, we're in great shape from a health standpoint. Off season's been good, pleased with the progress we've made and excited to uh, finish up everything in the weight room this week and then kind of get into phase two for us, which is spring practice. So with that, questions, David? Shane is Dowell has gotten in. Have you and he, you know, kind of come together on a consensus for what the playbook will look like? And are there certain things that you'll have to maybe table until the summer, like until you get past the second window of the transfer portal? Yeah, uh, a little bit of both of all that. Certainly, we've talked, you know, as far as what we're going to look like going forward. You've obviously got to present an offense to the players in spring practice, what that is, and there's going to be some new things that we call things. There's going to be some things that are identical to what we called them last year. I mean, there's going to be elements that we want to carry over. There's going to be elements that that you know either Dow wants to bring or that we've looked at as a staff and said we needed to be doing more of this or less of this like any any season as well. Certainly there will be some pieces, some players that, you know, we 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 add to the mix after spring practice for sure. Incoming freshmen, obviously, and uh, but the bulk of it, you know, will be in. And again, it's, it's why you go out there and practice. We know haven't we have an idea of what it wants to look like. I was reading some quotes from this press conference. I saw where Trey Knox said we were going to be up tempo and go really, really fast all the time. That was news to me. Um, so I'm glad Trey, Trey and Dow have discussed that. Dow and I haven't. Um, but that's uh, that's another story. But no, I mean, there's we went fast at times last year. But we want to see what best fits our personnel and, and what best fits us as a team, offense, defense, and special teams. But yes, we've had some conversations. And again, like I've said before, it's it's uh, what can our players best execute? Uh, there's things that we did well last year that we want to continue, and there's some things that as we sit there and try and um, um, make this offense the best it can be for us that we want to do differently, whether it be terminology or how we call plays, uh, operate overall operation, things like that that we can improve on. Shane, you mentioned the transfers and being able to have an opportunity to listen to them. I know just the last couple of years, short sample size, but you know, think of a guy like Juice, Nate Atkins, Carlin Patel, some of these players that have come from smaller colleges mm -hmm. and, and come on over and done a good job for you. When you guys identify some of those smaller school players, and I don't know if I can ask you without giving the secrets away, but you know, how what does that process look like, and why do you think you guys have been so successful in those first two seasons? I think one, it starts with uh, being willing to take someone from a quote unquote smaller school. You know, unfortunately, I think there's probably some schools that say we're in the SEC. Why would we look at a running back from a Division II school, no matter how successful that school is? Or why would we look at a defensive back from Assumption College? Or why would we look at a quarterback from St. Francis? It's great football everywhere and um, there's a lot of guys I mean you guys know high school cr recruiting is an inexact science and there's a lot of great players that should be coming in the SEC should be playing in the SEC but for whatever reason ended up at different schools and every situation is different so being willing to say there's great football players and great coaching all across the country it's just different levels um, and then for us, it's you watch the tape, you see, you know, the skill set on tape. Does it fit what you're trying to do as a program and what you're looking for at that position? And then you've really got to do a great job, whether it's a small school transfer or, or Spencer Rattler coming from Oklahoma, digging in to making sure, one, they're the kind of person you want in your program. Two, they have the competitive spirit and the work at the work ethic and the mentality that you want a player to have in order to be successful here. And and then if they fit all those things and, and you know, and, and you feel like they're going to be a fit, you trust your ability to bring them here and 
then develop them uh, on the field, in the weight room uh, as well. And we've done, a, you know, for the most part, a, a, a good job of doing that. But I'd say overall with the transfer portal in general, Mike, it's more difficult than ever because, I mean, these high school guys that we're recruiting, we spend years getting to know them. And some of these transfers that are bringing in, you're bringing in from a college, you literally have about 48 hours to find out everything you possibly can about a guy because he's on your campus and visiting or you're making a decision on whether you want to offer the guy or not to bring him on campus. And then they, he's got 10 other schools that are trying to do the same thing with him as well. So you've really – you got to reach out to a bunch of contacts and find out as much as you can about a guy in a short period of time, which is really challenging, to be honest with you. Yeah. Do you have any kind of an update on the three guys who were suspended last month? Still not a part of our team, still suspended. Um, you know, a lot of those decisions are made. That's a university issue as well, but uh, none of the three are, are currently with us and, and uh, don't anticipate them uh, being back with us uh, at any point in the near future, I'll say. I guess, Shane, from an identity standpoint with Dow, what do those conversations look like about what your identity looks like offensively, regardless of what plays you call, what system you run? Yeah, uh, probably very similar, Colin, to when I got hired. I mean, balanced, and what is balanced? Balanced to me is not 50-50. It's the ability to run the ball when you need to run it and throw it when you need to throw it. So we want to be able to do that. We want to be able to have a – to be a physical uh, offense that, that plays really, really hard – and uh, has the ability to be explosive. If you go back and look at our success the last two years, Colin, I mean, it's amazing. Just look at the explosive plays. For us, that's runs over 12 yards and passes over 18. When we win the explosive play battle in games against our opponent, I mean, our record is it's like lights out how good we are. So find, continuing to find the ability to be explosive and then whatever the identity is, quit freaking turning the ball over so much. I mean, it's two years in a row we've been last in the SEC in turning the ball over. It's embarrassing. And it's, for me as the head coach, it's really embarrassing that two years in a row, no one in the SEC has thrown more interceptions and fumbled the ball, to the, given the ball to the other team more than we have. So obviously we haven't done a good enough job the last two years, starting with me, of, of coaching that. And, um, and it's two years in a row we've been, I think in 2022, we led the SEC in takeaways. Excuse me, 2021, we led the SEC in takeaways. 2022, I think we were second in the SEC defensively in takeaways, and we only missed being leading it by one turnover, I believe. So we've been dynamic on defense. Let's continue to do that. But then offensively, this, we got to quit turning the ball over so much. Um, so to me, that's an identity. Quit giving the ball to the other team. Uh, run it when you need to run it. Throw it when you need to throw it. And let's continue to find ways to be explosive. Shane, how did you and D'Angelo Gibbs reconnect? Um, he was in here and saying that after he left Tennessee, he was down in Florida about to go start doing a Joe job, and yeah. then uh, you got the calls. How did how did he get back on your radar? Did, did the name just kind of re-enter the portal? How did all that work? Obviously, I knew the name because I was in Athens coaching at Georgia when D'Angelo was coming out of high school, and I know how heavily and hard we recruited D'Angelo when I was at Georgia uh, with Kirby. So I knew about him from that standpoint and, and knew about him as a person. Really, I'll be honest with you, David, had kind of lost track of him a little bit after he went to Tennessee. He had a relationship with Derek Moore, Demo. Um, Demo being over at Georgia Tech and, and having some connections to D'Angelo and his family. So D Demo actually mentioned, mentioned D'Angelo to me. It was probably late October, early November. We were getting ready to play Missouri or Tennessee, one of those last home games. And Demo just said, hey, D'Angelo, Gibbs, here's what's going on. He'd be interested in, in coming here and, and uh, walking on and joining the program for, this, for an opportunity. And uh, we promised him an opportunity to come, and, come in and compete, and we'll see what happens. And he's been, he's been – uh, He's been awesome. He really has been. You know, obviously, he'll be the first to tell you he probably needs to lose some weight and continue to get in shape, and that's to be understood. But he's got a—he's an old soul, and he's got a great maturity, you know, about himself. And and uh, kids and coaches on the team have kind of gotten to calling him, calling him the the OG, you know, because of his experience and and uh, age and whatnot. But D'Angelo, he's he's really. Uh, has not much he hasn't seen and hasn't been through. So he's been been good, you know, and, and proud of him to this point.
Shane, uh, going into the spring practice, uh, one of your returning players, obviously, uh, Nick Emmanuel, we know what he did last year kind of as a true freshman. So going into, I guess, this I guess phase of the offseason and then going into next year, uh, what are some things that you kind of anticipating from him and, and uh, I guess, some of his development and, and what kind of differences have you seen uh, from him, I guess, in this training period since the last season ended? Yeah, Nick's got to just continue to progress as a player. He obviously did some really great things as a true freshman that I don't think anybody – uh, anticipated. So for him, it's uh, continuing to take the next step physically, uh, getting more and more comfortable back there, uh, mentally being able to do more and more with uh, with what we're doing from a defensive standpoint, schematically, the knowledge of the defense, making calls, getting guys lined up, and then just continuing to take the next step. And, and we've got a lot of new faces on defense. So if you look at the returning production you know, Nick's right up there in regards to experience from all the games that he started. So it's hard to, you know, you don't really don't want to say that he's a necessarily one of the leaders of this team, but in a lot of ways he is just because of what he did last season. And he's played a lot of football for us and then continued to be a great special teams player for us as well. You know, Nick did some really good things on defense for us and and uh, and uh, because of depth issues in the secondary, didn't do as much on special teams. But Nick's got to be continue to get great as a DB. But now let's be an even more dominant special teams player for us as well uh, in 2023. Hey Shane, like you were talking about how in how thoroughly you investigate these guys, especially at smaller schools. Can you kind of talk more specifically about Mario and just the process of how you went through that and, you know, the thoroughness of that? Yeah. Um, you know, I know some of our recruiting staff people early on had seen his video, Gene, and they're like, this guy's, a you know, got something to him and is a really good player. And um, uh, watched it myself, and you just saw a lot of, production you saw a lot of touchdown runs um, for a really good team and really good program um, and then I think we told the story before we had Pete Limbo and Clayton White watch his tape you know to get their perspective on him you know are we missing anything and and you saw a skill set and you saw the things that that you uh, that you want to see out of a running back and then it was okay let's dig into his history a little bit and and, and uh, you know, reach out to the people, you know, down there in the Charleston area in regards to him in high school and the kind of person he is. And, and then the contact period opened up when he was in the portal and he came and watched one of our, I think one of our bowl practices before signing day. He came and spent some time around the team, watched bowl practice and had a, got a chance to know him. We hadn't offered him at that point. He just came and visited on his own and uh, got him around all of our you know, the people in our program, and they had a chance to get to know him in a short period of time. And then I think I called him the next day and, and offered him a scholarship here at Carolina. And he's a, he's a talented guy. And, and um, just watching him run around and work out, you know, he's got some explosiveness to him and, and is a strong, you know, strong young man and excited to watch him on the field here in a couple of weeks. And once we, you know, get out there and actually start practicing football. Shane, you enrolled a pretty large freshman class for this January period. What have you seen from the freshman group so far, especially a guy like Pup who had that experience playing at bowl practices to now? Yeah, it's been easier for Pup because he was around us for a few weeks and it wasn't, and it's a little bit of a smoother transition. They've been great. Um, you know, I think, you know, Coach Day would tell you what we've done with our guys in January and February has been really, 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 really challenging and hard. And we've put everybody on our team in some really, uh, difficult, you know, circumstances like every team does this time of year, trying to build that mental and physical toughness and camaraderie and leadership and and finding out who you can count on and things like that. And, and they, our guys have been in a lot of situations. And the thing that I would say is just with all those freshmen that came in, the the, the moment hasn't been too big for them, you know. And I've been proud of them. They've they've been in some tough situations and they 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 fight, they battle. And uh, they, they don't look lost, you know, that's to, to, to say the least. And, and then obviously it's a different deal once we start practicing uh, a week from Tuesday, but anticipate them just continuing the, the progression that they're on right now and continue to get better. Yeah, I think every player we had in here today uh, sighed and shook their head and we asked about uh, Coach Day's strength program and what he's been putting them through, you know, this off season. Just how have you seen that strength training and, and what they're doing translate to the on-field stuff? Yeah, it's been great. I mean, I could go on and on about that. One, it's uh, 
it, it goes back to challenging everybody. That's the one thing I love about Luke and, and his staff is they're very willing to think outside the box. And I don't want to say we're unorthodox, but we probably do some things that other schools don't do, um, that there's a science behind it and things like that. So Luke's not afraid to try new things. He's willing to think outside the box. He's a very creative thinker, he and his entire staff, um, and they're very hands-on. So it starts with that. Uh, to going back to challenging the whole staff, let's find better ways of doing things, doing better than we ever have before. And since we've been here at Carolina, and, and they've you know taken that to heart, and I think just the the overall strength gains you know that our guys have made uh, are impressive. I mean that translates over to the field, obviously uh, getting stronger, looking more like SEC football players at certain positions uh, for sure. Um, you know, so I've been pleased with that. And then this time of year, it's about getting stronger. We've spent, you know, probably a little bit more time on running. So we're doing a little bit more running going into spring practice than we did last season, just so they can handle the running that we'll be doing once we start practice. So that's been good just from a conditioning standpoint. And like every team in America right now, it's all about just building that mental toughness and, and along with how connected can we become as a team and all that takes place in the weight room and out on the field in those off-season workouts. So I've seen a lot of it, you know, translate over and and we'll continue to lift and get stronger throughout spring practice as well. We don't stop lifting weights. We just do it on the days we don't practice. And then the summertime will be really, really critical as well for that group also. Uh, Trey Knox was in here earlier saying he thinks he has a little bit of Jaheim Bell in him. He feels like he's already a leader in that tight end room. What have you seen from him, and how is he kind of going to be an asset to this team already just as a weapon in that passing game? Yeah, he's an athletic guy. I mean, he's, he's impressive. That tight end group's really impressive, period. And uh, we've got so much more depth in that room and different skill sets. we got guys, you know, that are your true, more conventional tight ends, if you will. You know, and, and not that we didn't have it last year, we just got more of them. And Trey's a big body. Josh Simon's a you know a stud and, and experienced guy. And Nick Elksness, and then the uh, freshman that we have here as well. It's a good group. I mean, it went from we don't even really have tight ends in the bowl game to we've got like I don't want to say too many because you never have too many, but we got a lot of them. And I think Trey's it's been good for Trey. One, he's 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 very uh, he's a great young man great personality as you guys saw today always has a smile on his face i saw where he commented about you know the family atmosphere here and that's pretty cool to hear him say as a head coach you know because he's coming from another sec program and he's been around the block a while so um he's we talk about positive energy all the time he's a guy that's always got positive energy and um, he's an athletic guy that I think is working really, really hard in the weight room, uh, on special teams, on offense. And I think it's been a good transition for him. We're not necessarily taking everything that they did at Arkansas and saying all of a sudden this is our offense at Carolina, but there is some carryover in certain elements of what we're doing offensively where from a learning standpoint, uh, I think that's been a little bit easier for Trey and he can help those other tight ends as well because he's got some experience and maybe what Dow's calling and, and things like that that, that have that has carry over uh, carried over from Arkansas. Shane, it, it seems like there's been an unusual amount of turnover in coordinators, particularly on offense in the SEC and in your geographic footprint. Um, what do you think about that? And then part two, are, are you concerned uh, for college football um, that guys are going to the NFL for – I'm not going to say what reasons you can say, but mm -hmm. is, is that a concern? Uh, the first part about the SEC coordinator or the coordinators in general, because it's not just SEC, yeah, I was uh, – I'll be honest with you, I really hadn't thought about it, and I saw a stat about that a week or two ago and kind of opened my eyes, particularly in the SEC, all the new offensive coordinators in the SEC. And and I think every situation is, is, um, is different. You know, some guys didn't leave by their own choice. Some guys left for what they consider maybe better opportunities. Uh, to me, you do a great job. And you're at the highest level of college football when you do a great job in a coordinator position. There's opportunities that present themselves that are, in their minds, opportunities to advance their career, for sure. Uh, just like, you know, being a head coach, it's a very volatile position and uh, a lot with a lot of pressure, you know, as well. So I think you see that also. And, and But again, every situation is different. But it is unique, you know, when you talk about 
every summer we sit down as a staff and talk about the 12 opponents that we're going to play each, uh, each year. And we talk about the returning guys on offense, including the coaching staff, defense, special teams. There'll be a lot of newness this year that we got to figure out as far as, you know, our offseason studies of, 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 uh, of teams and coaching staffs. And yeah, it's concerning. There's no doubt about it. I think the quality of life um, right now as a college football coach is not as good as it can be. And I think there's a lot of guys, Gene, that one, their end goal is to go to the NFL. Some coaches feel that way, you know, that they, to me, that's like, or not to me, but to them, that's the pinnacle and they want to get to the NFL. So I think that's always been the case. And, and there's always been a lot of guys, not just now, there's always been college coaches that have said they want to go to the NFL because they're tired of recruiting. You know, I've heard that before. It's not like that just already started, but I think there's a lot of elements of college athletics that are more, it's a, it's, it's a different time period. I don't want to say more challenging. We're just dealing with things as college coaches that we've never dealt with before. And everybody's trying to figure it out and navigate it uh, as well. And it's a 365 day a year job. I was listening to a podcast a couple of weeks ago with an NFL coach and he was getting interviewed and he was talking about college coaching and because he had been in the college ranks and he was talking about pro coaching and he was saying how he loves the NFL because there's days this time of year and there's days in the summertime where he'll go four or five days without even looking at his cell phone. And that is like <laughs> so foreign to me like I don't even know what that feels like uh I have a hard time going four or five minutes without looking at it and he's going days so it's just different you know because you don't have the recruiting part of it in the NFL but definitely I know I'm getting long winded with your answer Gene but there's some things and we've talked about it as coaches that certainly the the recruiting calendar and and when you're doing things uh, we can can be adjusted, you know, around not just this time of year in the summertime, but December was a grind with, you know, signing day and the transfer portal and getting ready for a bowl game and everything else. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that we're, we're, go we're all going through it for the first time and we're all trying to figure out how to make it better and, and more sustainable for everybody. And this isn't me jumping on a soapbox and saying things are tough. I love what I do and, and, uh, and love – who I do it with and, and don't feel like I've ever worked a day in my life. But certainly, um, you know, when you're off, you're not really off in college athletics. But I think that's always been the case. So sorry for like the <laughs> six minute answer on that. Yeah, I got two for you. How do you feel about the uh, proposals to speed up the college game and mm -hmm. <clears throat> eliminate some plays? And also your thoughts on, uh, I guess, the reports of Oklahoma and Texas joining the SEC maybe earlier than expected? Uh, speeding up the game. Yeah, that was something that we discussed. We had a head coaches meeting, all the SEC head coaches. We were in Birmingham, I think, two weeks ago today, if I'm not mistaken, or three weeks ago today, one. Whatever day that was announced, as a matter of fact, it came out that night, uh, whenever that was. Uh, and that was one of the things that we discussed. And, and that was my first time hearing about it, to be honest with you. And, and uh, I'm, I, I'm all for what is one – continues to make williams Bryce Stadium such an unbelievable fan experience on a Saturday because it's already elite, and we don't want to lose that. We want to continue to make that the case. And if that means that these games are getting a little bit too long, then certainly you know I'm all for looking at ways to adjust it because there was a study done, and frankly our games are a lot longer than NFL games, just time length and things like that. And, and then certainly – one area of concern is with the expanded playoff. There's a potential, I think, for teams to play what 17 games. I think would be the max if you if if you want played in a conference championship game and then what four playoff games. I think that's right. That's a lot of football. And when you talk about games that are sometimes close, an offense may play 100 plays, and then you times that by 17. That's a lot of football plays. So when you talk about player safety and things like that. Those are all things that we certainly need to consider. So uh, I know it's still being discussed, but um, um, I can see why. And then in regards to Oklahoma and Texas, yeah, I think it's great. You know, I thought it was exciting that they're coming into the league, exciting for our fans to be able to take a trip to Norman, Oklahoma or Austin, Texas, and, or, and for them to come here. But then also uh, the way the schedules, it sounds like will be adjusted. We're 
you know, we'll be able to get uh, pretty much everywhere in the SEC over a four-year span or two-year span, I guess is what it is, four-year span, um, that every freshman that came in here would get a chance if he stayed four years to see every every venue. I think it's uh, – I think it's good, and certainly we play a really, 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 really challenging schedule every single season, and that's only going to make it more and more challenging. But I'm excited for it when it happens, and and then I got enough to worry about with 2023 right now. But you know, looking forward to getting them in here. I'll, I'll ask you too because I know Colin was talking about asking you this one just to piggyback off that. The first one would be Clemson, you know. Would you still want to be able to play that game? Because obviously with everything that's going on with the SEC, there's a possibility that there could be less non-conference games. I'm sure I know what the answer is going to be, but just to give you the, the opportunity to talk about that. Yeah, I would. I mean, I think it's a, one of the great rivalries in, in all of college, uh, college football and don't really want to see that go away. I mean, there's no question if we play nine conference games uh, and then, you know, an in-state rival like them, that – your schedule year in, year out is probably going to be one of, if not the toughest in the country year in, year out. But as a competitor, uh, I love that. And I don't, I'm a college football um, uh, traditionalist and all that. And I don't want to see those rivalries, you know, go away because of, uh, because of conference expansion. So, yeah. And the other question for you, I know you can give me the coach answer, but, you know, heading into year three, expectations especially externally I'm sure internally as well are higher than when you first arrived here yeah what's just different you feel like going into this season in terms of where this program is in comparison to where this program was in your first year around this time one outside this building just like you said the the expectations the energy and excitement you know about South Carolina football is a lot higher than what it was two years ago I get a lot more media requests that Steve comes to me with this year than I did two years ago. I get a lot more um, invitations to speak at different corporate events and things like that outside of Gamecock Club, you know, events. My first year here, I think the Gamecock Club wanted to talk to me and maybe the Rotary Club, which is great. You know, now it's just a lot more regionally, nationally, whatever, which is, is different for me. Uh, different for me from a personal standpoint um, and love that part of it. Don't get me wrong. So that part's been different outside the building, which we want those expectations and that energy level. And then I think just inside the building, Mike, it's it's just the expectations with our guys of what we expect, you know, day in, day out. There's not as many knock on wood issues that, that come up um, academically or guys being on time or doing what they're supposed to do. I'm not sure what door y'all walk in and out of each day, but the door right down there at the bottom of the steps, the first sign they see when they come in the building each day and the last one they see is don't get tired of doing what's right, our players do. And to me, that's it. Like, don't get tired of doing what's right, and that's going to class, and that's being on time for everything. And if you're supposed to weigh in before a workout, weigh in. If you're supposed to wear black shorts, black T-shirt, white socks and black shoes, and have that on, and we don't have to send you back because you got – Garnet shoes and, and 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 black socks or whatever it may be. So just just that, and then I think just the the type of young men that we that we continue to bring into the program that that uh, embody what we want to be about. It's a fun group to be around. It's a very you know workmanlike group that that knows what to expect. And year one, and in a lot of ways, year two, guys were still trying to you know figure that out in a lot of ways. And we've done some good things. We obviously got a lot of work to do. By no means have we arrived. And now the challenge for us is we've gone from you know seven regular or six regular season wins to eight regular season wins. And now the challenge, and it's a big challenge, is to take you know that next step. And it's continuing to do the things that we've done really really well. Uh, do them better than we've done them, and then continue to, in every area. Don't we're not getting complacent, you know. We're continuing to to move forward, players, coaches, staff. Thank you, coach. Yep. Thank you, guys. See y'all soon.